Good evening, lovely listeners, and welcome back to Raven Reads. I'm Raven, and tonight we have the second episode of the podcast, In Your Dreams. This episode is entitled False Dichotomy. Before we get going, I just wanted to let you guys know that you have until about September 20th to order something from the shop that is not digital. Uh, The pre-orders will still be ongoing, obviously, because they're pre-orders. Uh, but I will be packing up my shop items for the move into my future husband's house, (laughs) um, around September 20th. So I won't have access to them for a bit. So if you want bookmarks or pins or anything like that, uh, you'll want to go to ravenreadshorror.com and go ahead and grab that while you can, if you need them early or whatever. Uh, Also, as I mentioned, the uh, anthology is going to be um, on pre-order until Halloween when everything gets shipped out. So if you want my very first fictional horror anthology, uh, you can go ahead and go to ravenreadshorror.com slash collections slash books. And finally, if you want to relax to soundscapes and Um, eventually to music and guided meditations that aren't necessarily horror related. If you want to take a a breather and a palate cleanser, um, I have a brand new channel called The Secret Garden Relaxation Room. And uh, I will put a a link down there in the video description uh, and um, subscribe if you are interested in relaxation that is not in horror form. (laughs) Um, And now without further ado, it is time to get comfortable, grab a beverage of choice, and get ready to take another journey into the night. After a long day, Kim was glad to be home. She tossed her book bag to the side, watched TV, and then settled in for a night of sleep. In the middle of the night, she woke up. Unable to determine why she had woken up, she tried to turn over so she could go back to sleep. But that's when she realized that she couldn't move. Moreover, every time she attempted to move, It felt like every nerve ending was on fire. This was more than just paralysis. This was torture. Not one to be deterred, she thought perhaps she could trick her body, convince her mind that she was relaxed and then move quickly to break out of it. So she went limp and then with a start, attempted to turn over in a single swift motion. A surge of pain raged through her entire body. She couldn't move an inch. Kim wasn't entirely afraid, yet. She knew what sleep paralysis was. She knew that it presented with paralysis and, often, hallucinations. While Kim had always believed in the paranormal, she had also always believed that sleep paralysis was a real medical condition or physical phenomenon, and only that. So when she saw the armless, wispy, dark figure by her closet door, she wasn't entirely alarmed. Soon, she stopped trying to fight the paralysis and just watched. The figure, which she described as a dementor without arms, floated to the bottom of her bed. Then, it made its way slowly to her headboard and leaned over her. A moment later, It righted itself and made its way back to the foot of her bed, leaning over her yet again. The figure repeated this motion a few times and then whooshed through the wall above the headboard and disappeared. In that moment, the paralysis broke, the pain subsided, and Kim was finally able to move again. She later described the experience as feeling that this entity was inspecting her looking for something within her that it couldn't find. While slightly rattled, Kim assumed that the entire experience had been sleep paralysis and nothing more. That was until she was talking to her friend Sarah just a few weeks later. 
Sarah had recently spent the night with Kim, and as usual, they were just talking about random topics. The subject of sleep paralysis came up. Kim was about to tell Sarah about her strange experience, but before she could, Sarah said something that sent chills down Kim's spine. You know, she said, I had the strangest experience over at your house when I spent the night. I was asleep, but then I woke up in the middle of the night, completely paralyzed. Every time I tried to move, it hurt. And then there was this weird, wispy shadow figure that kept bending over me. Then it went through your wall and I woke up. It was so wild. Kim was speechless. What she had easily dismissed as a normal episode of parasomnia before, she now started to question. Why did they both see the same entity? Why did they both have the exact same experience in the exact same place, Kim's room? Kim started thinking over the experience, and the more she did, the more sleep paralysis alone just didn't seem to make sense. Why was she in pain? Why did her friend have the exact same experience? And perhaps the most intriguing question of all, what if choosing between sleep paralysis and a genuine paranormal experience is a false dichotomy? What if there's a spectrum? And if there is, how do we know where science ends and the supernatural begins? I'm Raven, and I'd love for you to come with me on a journey into the scientific, the supernatural, and the space between, as we explore the scary side of sleep on this episode of In Your Dreams. According to nearly every scientific article on the topic, sleep paralysis is nothing to fear. It's a normal occurrence that's likely to happen to 8% of people at least. If you're a student, a psychologist, or you do shift work or hold a stressful job, your likelihood goes up to 30%. And in some ways, this makes sense, given the prevailing theory that those who have irregular sleep patterns or are highly stressed are far more likely to experience sleep disturbances like sleep paralysis. After all, sleep paralysis is normal. It happens to us every night. It's just not something that we're usually conscious for. We're not meant to be conscious for it. It's supposed to protect us from moving around in our sleep and getting hurt. Ask any professional in the field, and they'll tell you that the experience of sleep paralysis is a parasomnia. And while it's terrifying, it's simply your mind waking up before your body. What you should experience in a dreamlike state, you are instead experiencing awake. And while you should be able to move once you're awake, you are instead locked into the natural paralysis of sleep. This combination produces a harmless but horrifying event wherein you can see your nightmares in your waking life, but you can do nothing to escape them. Doctors will tell you not to worry. Nothing can hurt you. It's scary, but totally fine. And unless it's a recurring event, which is a sleep disorder, sleep paralysis is more or less a neurological, psychological parlor trick. But is it true? Most people who approach the topic with a critical mind, and even those who are sold out on the idea that there is always an element of the supernatural within a sleep paralysis episode, will admit that sleep paralysis probably, almost certainly, does have a physical and psychological root. Most people don't debate that. But, at least from what I've read and researched, where proponents of a supernatural element start to diverge is on the issue that it has to be either physical or paranormal. What if it's a spectrum? What if the root cause of sleep paralysis itself is physical? 
but that state opens you up to paranormal attacks or experiences. Vulnerability, after all, seems to be a magnet for paranormal activity, especially the malevolent sort. And the question we raised last time returns to us again. Why are the experiences so consistent? In order to truly understand just how eerily consistent sleep paralysis experiences are, you have to take a deep, deep dive into the lore of the old hag and the few entities, for lack of a better term, that often appear alongside or in place of her. This is not a few people from a few places saying they had the same nightmare. We're talking about a nearly universal experience. Sleep paralysis, accompanied by the old hag or versions of her, appear in Denmark, Norway, Canada, Fiji, Nigeria, Turkey, Thailand, China, Japan, Korea, Tibet, Cambodia, Mexico, Egypt, Morocco, Hungary, the United States. The list goes on and on and on. In fact, in my research, I have not yet found a region of the world that doesn't have an old hag lore. What's more, most of these stories originate from times before memes, creepypastas, and the internet at large could have allowed for the prolific spread of viral stories. In our exploration of sleep paralysis, I want to take the time to go through the many regions, cultures, and countries where old hag, incubus, and female demonic entities are believed to exist and to prey on people at night while they sleep, specifically during episodes that look a lot like sleep paralysis. This exploration will begin in our next episode with Ogun Oru, a traditional explanation for sleep paralysis-like disturbances among the Yoruba people of Southwest Nigeria. But for this episode, and in preparation for this series of cultural and regional examinations, I want to focus mostly on the question, does it have to be one or the other? Personally, I don't think it does. In fact, it's my belief that in most cases where we're forced into a hard choice, the truth lies somewhere in the middle. Not always, of course. But there's a trend I've noticed in reading up on this issue that I find interesting and somewhat concerning. Most of the time, whenever I'm reading an article from a scientific standpoint, there is no room for the paranormal. I've even read material more than one source, that claims that the mere suggestion that there could be a paranormal explanation for any part of sleep paralysis sends us straight back to the Stone Age and undermines science as a whole. The scientists don't protest too much, methinks. Dr. Leslie Ellis of DrLeslieEllis.com wrote a blog post back in 2020 entitled, No Need to Fear the Old Hag, Sleep Paralysis Briefly Explained. She starts out by saying the following, quote, Locals will warn you never to sleep on your back in Newfoundland or risk a visit from the old hag. She steals in on the night fog just as you are falling asleep. She is an apparition that crawls up from the foot of your bed and sits on your chest so heavily you can't breathe or move. Sometimes she may try to seduce you, other times to kill you. These terrifying experiences are so common in Newfoundland, they have become the subject of a TV series aptly called Hag. They are also the subject of research into the relationship between sleep paralysis and folklore. There is a physiological explanation for sleep paralysis, and there are good reasons these peculiar events feel like visitations by the old hag or some other kind of apparition. End quote. Somewhere within the mystical language and the somewhat condescending, it feels like that, but it's not language, is the assumption that even though a whole group of people, and as she will later admit, the world, experiences much the same delusion, it's all physical and there's nothing to worry about. Later, she says this, quote, having an episode doesn't mean you are losing touch with reality or being visited by the ghost of an old sea witch, 
These legends in various guises have been around since Sumerian times as a way to make sense of those frightening occasions when we wake up paralyzed, unable to move from the neck down." End quote. I'll hand it to her that throughout history, we common folk have come up with a lot of interesting explanations for things that we later found out were normal, physical, or otherwise natural occurrences. But I think the hand-waving explanation of those silly ancient folk just didn't understand, let's not be stupid like them, is not only rude and insensitive, but it kind of amounts to it's just the house settling. Sometimes it is, but often it's not. And science itself, while staunch and often rightly proud of its accomplishments, hasn't been short on its own, shall we say, interesting beliefs in the past. There's a long list of scientific theories and beliefs, some which were held for an entire generation before they were debunked, that we ultimately found out were not true. This isn't an indictment of science as a discipline. Indeed, science is all about posing theories, testing them, and then, hopefully, taking an honest reading of the data and changing your viewpoints if they're wrong, or if you're right, having tested data to back up your ideas. This process makes wrong theories necessary, even welcomed. But the point here isn't that science is worthless and should never be wrong. The point is that sometimes it is. Sometimes it is for a very long time. And these days, it seems that the scientifically inclined are more and more disinclined to be open to paranormal or supernatural explanations, or even the idea that what we understand now might not be so. There are two problems with this staunch naturalism, in my opinion. One is that it's slightly arrogant and assumes that whatever we currently understand about the natural world is correct. Two, it assumes that the paranormal isn't scientific, when there have been countless cases of creatures and experiences that were once written off as paranormal or science fiction that are now very much a part of accepted scientific literature and canon. To the first point, I would like to provide some examples of scientific theories that endured for a long time that were ultimately disproved. Phrenology is one example of a theory that lasted for over half a century, if not longer. In 1796, the idea was posed that you could study the shape of the skull and its various parts and determine the strengths, personality features, and other faculties of a person based on their proportions and shapes and other things. Today, this is widely considered pseudoscience, if not just simply bogus, but it would take until at least the mid-1800s before the idea was disproved. And it wasn't truly until the turn of the century when it finally began to fall out of public belief. Luminous ether was another idea that enjoyed significant acceptance in scientific communities. The belief was that there was a mysterious substance responsible for transmitting light throughout the universe. Of course, once experiments in the refraction and diffraction of light helped us figure out how light works, and then when Einstein's theory of relativity added to the body of evidence, luminous ether fell out of favor. Today, it sounds more like a power you would get in a fantasy video game than a scientific topic. Again, Luminous ether was proposed as an idea in 1887, but it would be the early 1900s before it truly fell out of favor, after late 19th century experiments began to jeopardize the notion. There are many more examples we could cover, like the expanding or growing Earth theory and the proposed existence of Martian canals, which later turned out to be an optical illusion but we'll cover one more theory that was ultimately disproved before moving on. That theory was the idea that an element called phlogiston existed. It was fire-like and resided in combustible bodies. During combustion, it was thought that this phlogiston was released. The theory was trying to explain burning processes, like the rusting of metal, combustion itself, and other terms that are now jointly referred to as oxidation. What's wild about phlogiston is that this theory was accepted basically as fact for over 100 years. That means there are people who were born 
lived and died entirely believing that a non-existent element called phlogiston was responsible for what we now know is oxidation. Again, none of this is meant to cast a bad light on science as a discipline. Instead, it's just meant to open our minds a bit. To realize that even what we're sure is real today might be disproved tomorrow, or long after we're gone. So what we believe about sleep paralysis today might be wrong too. Maybe it's not, but we can't be so arrogant as to close our minds entirely to the possibility that something beyond our realm of understanding could be responsible for at least a part of the phenomenon. Finally, let's look at the logical and understandable reasons that some doubt the notion that sleep paralysis is entirely natural or that every experience that presents like sleep paralysis is such. Much of the reason that those in support of the science alone theory of sleep paralysis offer for their beliefs is that sleep paralysis has a set of symptoms, so to speak, and that those symptoms have been proven to be nothing more than parasomnia. Therefore, there's no reason to attribute supernatural ideas to the experience. There's no reason to consider that it might be anything else. But what if we went about treating all medical conditions that way? Consider this list of symptoms. Fatigue, vision problems, numbness and tingling, stiffness, weakness, pain, problems with thinking, depression or anxiety, cramping of the muscles, and a headache. If you're having trouble narrowing down what this list of symptoms could possibly be referring to, you're right. Now, the symptoms that I took to create this list are from multiple sclerosis. But if you've ever had a migraine, you might see yourself in these symptoms, even if you don't have MS. In fact, many conditions that are very much not MS often present with nearly identical symptoms. Of course, this is a gross oversimplification because even within MS, there are different types of symptoms that come in different groups. But for argument's sake, we'll focus on the common symptoms of MS. There are many, many conditions that have very similar symptoms. Migraine, radiologically isolated syndrome, or RIS, neuropathy, brain tumors, Lyme disease, stroke, and a whole host of others. What if you walked into the doctor's office with a migraine and they diagnosed you with MS or vice versa, just because it presented the same as other instances of an illness they knew about? Not good. Sure, misdiagnosing sleep paralysis might not carry the same side effects, but is it any more responsible? Probably not. Another issue with the science alone explanation for sleep paralysis is that, as we will uncover in the next several episodes, the old hag, or a close derivative of her, appears almost universally in association with sleep paralysis. If you want to see sleep paralysis as merely a state in which your mind is dreaming while conscious and paralyzed, then why does almost everybody see the same thing? And why do they see different things during sleep paralysis than they do when they're dreaming? I have never yet heard a story about sleep paralysis where the person simply had a nightmare that played out in front of them. I've had a couple of experiences in my life where the nightmare I was having seemed to play out in my room for a moment, when my mind woke up just a second before my body. But it was the nightmare I was having. It wasn't the old hag. It was typical. And it wasn't true sleep paralysis. So why does this old hag with differences that only seem to account for cultural dress and appearance, appear to virtually everyone all over the world. When has there ever been a case of a worldwide shared delusion? Even in dream archetypes that we all share, like falling and waking up just before you hit the ground, it's not the same fall or the same ground or the same scenario or the same dream. You can try this for yourself. Get together with several of your friends or send them an email and talk about your nightmares. Ask them what nightmares they remember most vividly and compare them. If you can find four people 
to all tell you that they had the exact same specific entity in their nightmares that appeared with almost the exact same scenario, I would be really surprised. Now repeat that, but for thousands and thousands of people in virtually every culture, continent, and community around the world. Nearly every people group that exists has an old hag lore, and that just doesn't make sense. Finally, and I know this won't be accepted by everyone, we have to look at the numerous, numerous accounts of people, even those who had never previously been religious, who have reported that this old hag entity has fled in response to prayer, the name of Jesus, or other religious appeals. Hallucinations don't tend to do that. Nightmares don't tend to do that. In fact, at least based on my research thus far, the only thing I've ever read about or learned about that flees in the face of an appeal to Jesus or prayer or the like is a demonic entity. To be sure, this isn't the strongest point of evidence in the not just science camp, but it is something to consider nonetheless, even if we just look at it and go, interesting. Finally, it's important to acknowledge the fact that when it comes to the demonic or the malevolent side of the spiritual world, vulnerability attracts oppression. Even though the paralysis of sleep is a naturally occurring thing, what if the visions are not? What if what we see when we wake up prematurely during an episode of sleep paralysis is not just our mind's nightmarish projection, but a glimpse into the darker side of the spirit world, into the entities and forces that surround us every single night? What if all we're really seeing is the horror that we usually sleep through? If demonic and malevolent entities want to incite fear as a means of power, which it's almost universally accepted that they do, why wouldn't they do it when we can't fight back? Why wouldn't they wait until we can see them, but we can't run? What if the physical opens the doorway to the paranormal? And what if ignoring it could be dangerous? I leave you with that thought for this episode, but next time we'll begin our examination of the old hag and the lore surrounding her as we continue our journey into the scary side of sleep. Until next time, sleep well. Uh...